Please join me in welcoming Maria Devana Headley, N.K. Jemison, Alice Sola Kim, Sam J. Miller, and Victor Laval. Everybody, my name is Victor Laval, and I'll be moderating tonight's discussion with these four amazing, amazing writers who have all contributed to a people's future of the United States. Could you give me one more round of applause for, for them? <laughs> Thank you. So um, what I wanted to do was sort of dive into just the chance to talk about the stories in the book and the impetus for the book. But uh, my first thing that I'm going to do is read to you all so you have a sense of what the book is trying to do. Um, what uh, The letter that we wrote, that myself and John Joseph Adams, my co-editor, what we wrote to all the authors who we hoped would uh, be willing to give us stories for the anthology. Uh, to help put them in the mindset of what we were hoping for. So, here's what they read. Here's what, what they got. A narcissistic demagogue has been elected president of the United States. He wants to build a wall between the US and Mexico. He plans to deport millions of immigrants and ban all Muslims. He's supported by the KKK. He mocked disabled people during speeches. He brags about sexually assaulting women. He makes a neo-Nazi his chief policy advisor. Some of these things are out of date. Uh, some of them are still relevant. This sounds more like the plot from a work of dystopian fiction than current events in the United States of America, and yet Trump's narratives do depict a dystopian world where many Americans are disposed of, imprisoned, assaulted, and killed. In this moment when reality has become much stranger than fiction, we are asking writers to seriously consider what it would mean and, how to, and to speculate how to reclaim the future of our country. Thus, we are publishing A People's Future of the United States, a collection of 20, turned out to be 25 because there were so many good ones, uh, a, a collection of 25 visionary speculative fiction stories that will show us the future through the eyes of those whose lives have been threatened throughout American history. People of color, women, immigrants, Muslims, and other persecuted religious groups, queer and trans people, we are seeking stories that show us new forms of freedom, love, and justice, narratives that release us from the chokehold of the history and mythology of the past, and writing that gives us new futures to believe in. So that's the idea at the heart of the anthology. And so I want to ask all of you, each of you, in whatever order you like, uh, when we sent this letter along and when that sort of charge question prompt was put to you, uh, how did it, did it help you or did it start you, how did it start you thinking about the story that eventually became the one in our anthology. I'll go. Um, I, I have done enough teaching that, you know, it always sort of frustrates me when no one will go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually had a, a half-finished story. Um, I had done the sort of basic draft of it already, and um, I was writing these stories for my Patreon. Um, I, I do them for um, just as a way to, you know, give something back to people who have been helping me. Um, they helped me quit my day job, so yay. Um, but I, I wasn't actually planning to, to publish any of these stories. I didn't think that this particular one was, was really, I, I wrote it in like rage, and I didn't think that it was like publishable. But when I saw this, I was like, you know what, I can make it publishable. <laughs> um, so that was it. Okay. Um, the prompt obviously was the most seductive thing I got in the years. I said yes instantly and didn't have a story at all. And uh, But I grew up survivalist Idaho. So I had this notion of what, what if it was a story that was written by someone who was born after the end? Someone who was born after the world ended. You know, And that's where my story came from. It came trying to imagine forward from this worst case, which is not the worst case. We're not at the worst case. There have been other much worse, worse cases. We're in a bad moment, but it's not as bad as we feel it emotionally right now. Um, so I started thinking about how to preserve the knowledge of, of the world. And, I ha and that's what I'm always interested in. It's a story about tattoos. <laughs> so obviously, I have personal 
lust and experience for that to with that topic. Um, but it was, I think all of the bits of it were already lurking inside of me, and I shoved them into this story. And it turned into something I wasn't exactly expecting. It turned into a text of its own, but it's a story about unexpected texts. So I'm a community organizer, uh, uh, and my job is about supporting folks who are directly impacted by a problem to be able to fight back to fix it. Um, so I'm a big fan of Howard Zinn, um, and A People's History of the United States is a really important uh, text for me, and, and thinking about how we tell history and, and whose histories has, have historically been centered. Um, so the concept was really intriguing. And, and also thinking about like, yes, I'm super mad and everything's super fucked up right now, but also like, this is not new and this, isn't, this did not come out of nowhere and this is not disruptive, right? This is like way bad and way worse than a lot of things, um, but also like very much, you can see how this happened by looking at recent and long-term uh, history. Uh, and also Prince had died um, and I was thinking a lot about Prince um, and I love Prince and I often when my divas die I find a way to write a story about them. Uh, so this is my Prince story. Uh, it's called It Was Saturday Night. I guess that makes it all right. Um, I had a very long and challenging road to writing my story for this anthology. You know, I, I, I sort of got the invite and I was like, that sounds great. Everyone involved sounds great. I have no idea what I will do, but just kind of like say yes first and then, you know, figure out the rest later. Um, and just to like, you know, full disclosure, like this is one of those instances where I'm just so grateful to the editors and to you and John because it, it just would not come. Um, and I, I think I also had this maybe sort of, I don't know, um, I had it locked into my mind, it was a misapprehension that it had to be optimistic. Or I was just like, well, there has to be some hope somewhere. Uh, and I was not feeling very hopeful about anything, you know, kind of um, personally or not personally. <laughs> and, 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 and then I, you know, but I still had to write this story. And I felt like uh, you and John were both so kind of encouraging, but also like, hey, where's the story? <laughs> and um, it, it finally kind of came as many of my stories do, which is in a moment of delirium. And, um, you know, I like writing things that sound like bad ideas because I'm like, this, this can't, this has to be terrible. But, like, why not give it a shot? Um, so I just wrote a story about what I was thinking about and what was in the air um, for me, which was, you know, about the shitty media man list. And, me Too and Time's Up and all that stuff. And uh, I, I honestly didn't know if I could make it like a, a story that, that felt like a self-contained short story that you know didn't rely on knowledge of the news or whatnot. Um, so uh, I enjoyed that challenge, and that's what came of it. I, like speaking per, from my perspective, right, one of the things that I find so interesting about all your answers already uh, is that uh, the stories themselves uh, are every single one of them deal with some pretty uh, intense material. I don't know how else to put it. Pretty either they're violent or they're em physically violent, emotionally violent, uh, both uh, and more. Uh, and yet somehow I do think, at least as I read them, each of them did seem hopeful in a way, or at least um, not destroyed. The people at the end didn't seem destroyed by the thing, not or some of the people didn't seem destroyed by the thing, <laughs> uh, right? And I wonder about that alchemy, like how do you, as as writers, how do you think about, right, like uh, working that line between hopeful and hopeless? Do you think about it, or does it just come out a certain way? And this can be bouncing around now. I think about it all the time. This, I, I also got neurotic for the same reason. I, I thought, oh no, this story is too bleak. It is so bleak because it begins with a death, with a child losing his father. And I, uh, I read a chunk of this story at ReaderCon, and it, I couldn't read the whole thing. I just read a, maybe like 10 minutes of it. And I stopped, and someone just said, oh no. <laughs> I was like... There's nice things too, nice things happen. So when I was balancing how to get there with this story, because I'm a person who also believes in the possibility of love and joy and, 
and grit to transform things. I am a believer in that. I think that changes the world. So I wanted to write about that as well. And I, it caused me to write a long history, like a bird's eye history. I wrote several generations past the collapse. I just kept going because I thought, OK, what happens when everything goes wrong? And then you live through it. And then there are children, and they live through it. What happens when you have grandchildren who didn't know weren't around for the collapse? And now this is the world. And the world still has bright and beautiful things in it. But I, I was nervous the whole time that I wasn't writing a nice enough story. <laughs> I mean, I kind of feel like that's that's the challenge that you threw us is is as we see the world um, turning into uh, this place that it actually, for some people, has been all along. Um, you know, places that it it you know our country in particular was not too long ago for you know my parents' generation, for example. Um, you know, turning back into. Um, a place that uh, not all of us are going to be particularly proud of. Um, as we see this happening, we, you know, the, the, the fear, the threat, the, the looming danger of all of it was that we could see the potential violence of it. Um, you know, the, the, the words, the rhetoric, um, the, the badgering, the, the bashing turns into violence if it isn't stopped. Um, and so this is, you know, it, it felt honest to engage with the bleakness of it uh, by talking about death and you know uh, just all kinds of horrible things, um, but I think that's the thing that that you know probably all of us may have um, engaged with as you're working on this incredibly bleak material. People survive that, and that in and of itself is is a story of hope. Um, you know, generations after a collapse, well, you just got a different world now. It's just different. Um, and that's what we've all got, all got to deal with and all got to address. Um, you know, in my case, I decided to write about dragons and collard greens. Um, you know, because I, I, like, the way I was sort of processing it was just sheer absurdism. Um, and the absurdism let me laugh at this terrifying notion of people mass forced into camps and, and just a bunch of other horrific things happening. Um, but you know, at the end of the, the day, they all sit down and they have a good meal. Um, that's what life under this kind of situation is like. I, can go. Oh. <laughs> um, I think I'm maybe either like a cheerful pessimist or a dour optimist. Hopefully I'm not like the worst combination of both. <laughs> um, but I think, um, I think in one way, like I, the hope in my story is actually like a sad, messed up hope because uh, I, I was thinking about um, you know men in the news who have been um, you know accused of um, rape, abuse, harassment, and uh, how these men seem to come back with these very I don't know circular uh, you know. Um, weird, non-apologetic mm -hmm. apologies. And so uh, in my story, I feel like I was, I was just like, the only way I can imagine someone actually coming to terms and facing you know, what they did, admitting it, and apologizing is they're forced to by dark magic. Uh, <laughs> like I was just like, that's the only way I can realistically <laughs> envision this. So that's sort of like wish fulfillment, but it's also, it's just like, I still can't believe it. I can't believe it can really happen, um, which is very pessimistic of me. Um, but where I sort of, uh, I guess, locate the hope in the story I wrote is um, is among the, the the friends who are dealing with this stuff. And um, and what what the story is about is failure and how you know even if we mean well, we fail each other. Um, and uh, that's okay. I think it's like good to talk about the ways in which we fail each other, kind of fall down on the job, or have like um, blinkers up, or something like that. Um, because you know nothing is perfect. You know even resistance isn't perfect. And even just sort of talking about it and, and admitting it and naming it, I think is is kind of hopeful in its own way. Also, it's hilarious. It's like one of the funniest things I've ever read. So <laughs> there's that. Um, 
you know, I swing back and forth between uh, ecstatic joy and like profound despair, like every five seconds of like, I'm listening to, I want to dance with somebody and I feel like bliss. And then I look at Twitter and I get blind with rage. Um, so yeah, this is, mo a lot of my fiction is me trying to come to terms with how a world can be so fucked up and so full of wonderful things and how people can be, can do such horrible things and participate often unwittingly in such horrible systems, but also, uh, you know, be capable of wonderful things as well. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know wh why that became a story of like a future where Prince is illegal um, and Big Brother is listening. But that's that's what that's what happened. I mean, it's interesting. Like, uh, at least to me, thinking about the. Um like uh, Alice, what you were saying about uh, that idea of how does a person, like the, the, almost the, there's a way that in each of these, in each of the stories, I guess really what I'm thinking of, uh, there's a necessary, it seems to me like a necessary optimism because so much history, right? Like you were saying, like, I don't know why if it's, it's pessimistic of me to think that men don't have this sort of, you sort of say like, well, but it, that's mostly history. It shows that it, it goes exactly the way your pessimism suggests. Right? I mean, I feel like this Northam thing, it's, in, it's amazing to see the work of, yeah, it was me, I'm sorry. No, it wasn't me. I, I'm not even in that picture. And I'm waiting like the third it step. It was the one-eyed man. It was, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and the third step will really be like, that's not my yearbook. You know, I didn't go to that school. Something like that. And that, uh, like in a way that the feeling like the even the pathways of each of your stories that it leads in the direction it does like even that it leads toward even moments of resistance succeeding strikes me as like a hopeful and optimistic sometimes in the face of how things often go in this I don't know, I'm taking us down an even bleaker path. So I'm gonna stop. I heard myself talking, I was like, this is going in a really bad direction. So I'm gonna stop now talking about human history and what it is. Um, but I want, you know what I wanted to ask instead was like, um, I wondered for you as readers, maybe even as younger readers, things like that, uh, if you were drawn to, um, for lack of a better term, like texts of resistance, did you read in that way when you were, when you were young? I'm thinking of myself, um, um, one of the things that I loved as a kid was these um, the Greek mythology books by the the couple who makes them. I always mispronounce their names. Delowers, Delairs, De yes. And there's a husband and wife team. Uh, one of them wrote them. The other one illustrated them. And um, the illustrations were the thing that I loved because they were really grotesque and disturbing. And at like six or seven, I was really drawn to like a guy with eyes all over his body and you find out he gets them all stabbed nice. out and oh all this kind of stuff, right? It's really like a... I mean, but Greek I, mythology is not exactly like nice, It's but not nice, yeah. but I guess I particularly like the especially not nice one. And from there I went to the <laughs> Norse mythology, so... It's also not also nice. Also super grim, right? <laughs> but weirdly, I guess what I'm trying to, where I'm lead, trying to lead this horse is uh, that there was a way that I found, I found something beautiful about um, how often the human beings fought the gods, mm. right? How often they refused the sort of whims of the gods, even when it destroyed them, right? Mm. Zeus and Hera destroyed who knows how many lives, mm. but we got trees out of it or whatever we got, you know, we got some <laughs> beautiful things out of it. Um, and uh, just wondering for you all as readers, I, just, I guess I'm always interested in, when I speak to really talented writers, I always wanna know kind of like how they were shaped like what shaped them when they were young as readers? Forget even the resistance or not. I just am wondering about each of you. I mean, I read mythology too growing up and, and I also, you know, Prometheus's liver, oh my God. You know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, yeah. and, and as I got older and as I started studying mythology instead of just kind of enjoying it, um, as I realized, as I kind of explored the, the mythologies of, of many, people around the world. And um, one of the things that um, kind of drew me to stories of gods as fallible and sometimes even monstrous or evil beings was just that the, the core of the story was bad things happen, but you'll survive and you might even win. 
Um, and you know, you, you, yes, there might be trees, um, or there might be fire, or you might actually manage to kill the God that's been dogging your family for years and years and years. Um, so, you know, or, or if you are uh, a trickster, if you're, if you're careful about what you do, um, you can change the whole paradigm of how the world works. Um, you know, it, you, and sometimes pay a horrible price for that. But um, it seemed more true to what I needed to understand about the world than what I was getting from, you know, I, I grew up, you know, Southern, uh, Southern Black Baptist. Um, you know, I wasn't getting messages that helped me get through from that. I was getting messages that helped me get through from Prometheus's liver. Um, yeah, um, so. My story for this anthology is actually about librarians creating an alternate library, which they call the Library of the Low. And it's the library of the untold un narratives, basically. It's revisions. It's translation, elision, changes in the text that we know that are being rewritten by this librarian who's like, fuck the canon. Um, the canon has led us here. So my library of the low is full of what I read as a little kid. It's um, re referenced our Ursula Major, who is, of course, Ursula Le Guin, and Octavia, um, the Empress, who is, um, of course, Octavia Butler. But in my childhood, I was reading lots of mythology and folklore as well, and also books, any book that had a woman's name on the, on the cover, I was like, maybe. And if I had learned that the woman was alive still and hadn't been killed for being writing these crazy things down, I, it was like instant full body bliss. So, so yeah, I've, I've always been very interested in, not just in texts of resistance, but just in texts that imply survival of their authors, that imply this person wrote more than one story and lived, she lived to tell the tale, you know? and. I mean, not just not just women, of course. I'm interested in all the people who who are not the people you would have expected to live through some of the events of our history. You would not have expected them to be able to write these stories down, to to have their words read again. And the idea that that there have been so many survivors who have managed to tell their stories is for me what keeps me <laughs> keeps me going, keeps me writing, keeps me writing books for children, hoping to create the same response for them. Writing books for adults, hoping to create the same response for them. I, here we are, we're still alive. Like, fucking fight for it. It's interesting, because you know, what does resistance mean? What, what, where do we find resistance? And I, and I think that's different for everybody. And for me, one of the sort of sites of resistance uh, coming of age as a young queer person was sex. And finding a text that is, um, you know, telling a story that is uh, talking about a kind of desire that I wasn't seeing anywhere else that validated um, what I was feeling and, and who I was uh, and how that can be really radical, right? Like that's, that can be about survival. That can be, you know, uh, being a queer person, like reading James Baldwin, thinking about being a out gay man in a time when you could well, not that you can't still be murdered for it um, or attacked or whatever, um, but thinking about the, the the courage that it took to live and to be who you were and to have sex with who you wanted to have sex with um, is not that different than like you know the courage of the mortals who defied the gods and said, I'm going to do this thing even though I'm pretty sure it's going to get me killed because not doing it would make my life unlivable. Uh, so for me, things like James Baldwin and Jean Genet that were sort of like about queer identity, but also, especially with Jean Genet, like thinking about queerness as criminality and what is, how, how then is criminality defined? Who is running the prisons? How are uh, the, how does the world function and how is it function based on some people being oppressed and marginalized and fucked over? Um. One of the things I read a lot when I was young was horror. Um, and I, I don't know if I, you know, really consciously, like, um, you know, thought of it a, a, like as sort of um, stories of resistance. I probably just liked them because they were vivid and deeply unwholesome, which is like all I wanted. Um, but I think that there's something about, you know, I, I would 
Stephen King at way too early of an age, you know, uh, which a lot of people I know did. Um, uh, Richard Matheson, I know, and you, um, you know, edited and wrote the intro to a, a great collection of his recently, um, and um, and just like really random anthologies by uh, this anthologist named Helen Hoke, and um, those were very formative because they would just all be in the library and they would have these like. I don't, not disgusting, but really horrifying um, covers that seem kind of safe because they were like kind of 60s, 70s, but you would just stare at them and kind of fall into them <laughs> in a dark dream. Um, but she was just this anthologist who would kind of just combine, you know, all of these um, horror from different eras. Um, and uh, a lot of those stories I didn't understand, but still read with great interest. And I think something I got from um, my reading of horror at an early age was just that. Like, you know, in the story, um, there would be this horror or this thing that was after you, and it was, it, it's, it's made for you somehow. Like, it wants you specifically, which is part of the awfulness of it. Like, it's like a lock and key. Um, and I really do, I mean, I feel like that's just really applicable to life in the sense that um, there are all these horrors that, that feel like, depending on who you are, right? Or what groups you belong to, um, you know, there there are things, institutions, people, ideas after you because of who you are, um, and you don't always survive. You often don't, um, and sometimes you do. And of course, in these stories, there are so many ways of doing that. You know, by becoming a monster, the monster, getting away from it, creating your own light, you know, etc. And you know, I always found that very fascinating. I wonder if any of you are watching that, uh, sp speaking of that, that show, uh, Russian Doll. Anybody watching that one on Netflix? I just, uh, it's uh, amazing. It's amazing, amazing. I just started watching it yesterday or whatever. But, um, <laughs> but uh, it's a similar, there's an idea, Natasha Lyonne is the main, is the main character. And um, I don't think it spoils anything, but uh, she's at a party. She leaves that party and she just keeps dying and then coming back. And dying and coming back. And what's interesting is what she's constantly trying to figure out. I'm only four episodes in so far. But um, she keeps being like, there's something I have to do or change or think differently to fix things. And one of the horrors of the show is that, at least so far, it seems like, no. Like, you're not going to fix that you're dying. That's not going to be a thing you change. And it's super creepy. Because like the first episode or two, you're like, yeah, you know, be nice to, it's about be nice to people and then everybody will live forever. Or, uh, you know, apologize for hurting someone else and then you'll be okay. And then she just turns a corner, falls over a railing, dies again, is back in that bathroom and you're just like, fuck, what's the answer? And then at a certain point, like by episode four there, you start to see that what they're trying to at least make you think about is this idea like, um, that's not the, you're not gonna trick death. Right? So what are you going to do like, with your day? Um, and it's really profound. And Natasha Lyonne is, as always, incredibly funny and charming. But um, uh, I feel like, in a way, at least as I was reading all your stories, but the other stories as well, um, there was a sense for me of everybody um, somewhat similarly wrestling with like, a thing that you can't just defeat. Right? Like none of the stories in the anthology ever say, and then the day after that, we fixed human beings <laughs> and life was great, right? And so for, for me, it, it feels like really uh, beautiful and honest in that way and frightening as well. Uh, and I just, at least for me, I'm just curious or wondering like if you, if that sounds familiar to the story you wrote, if, if that feels in any way like something that you are in your work in general, uh, do you imagine that there's ever a story where it's just like, and now life was solved? I mean, I've read your works. I don't think that that's the case. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, I, but I always do wonder that. I'm curious about that. 
I mean, I always feel like this comes down to uh, a happy ending in a story. Um, and happy endings often just feel profoundly dishonest, mm -hmm. right? And even when I write a happy ending, I want to qualify it somehow. I want to have there be some horrific thing that happens so that you, didn't, you don't get away clean. Because if you get away clean, it feels like, well, then what was the point of all this? Um, so just as a storyteller, um, I don't think it's good, good uh, practice to make everything OK. Um, but as a person, I'd like to think that it's possible. But not as a writer. <laughs> Trouble is our business. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if I actually had anything to say. I was just filling the gap. Um, I think in my work, I'm, I'm often, when I was a teenager, I had a near-death experience. And so, and everything changed and nothing changed. I went back to school. I was in ninth grade. And I thought everything was different, and everyone thought I was the same person. And I was like, yeah, but now I know what it's like to die. So, and now I know that lots of these things don't matter, and yet everything still mattered. Um, and so in my work, I'm, I'm constantly <laughs> trying to, to battle with the, the idea that anything is ever what it looks like, that anything is simple. And I'm also constantly thinking, Here's here's this the simplest haiku of a story, you know. You never you don't get out of life alive. You don't get out of life unscathed. It's just the littlest thing, and it's what all stories are, and um, and to have to have just personally like come back from dying and kind of kind of horribly, and returned to to being a person who can walk around looking unscathed was. Um, has informed my entire career and made me and informed all of my understanding of stories across the across history because I think it's all that it's all like what what do you do with your day what do you do with your last day because every day is your last day it's all the same stakes really and do you can you change the world at all yeah like the great joy of of it is that you can you can change the world a lot you can do so many things, and that's not always happy. I mean, changing the world isn't always happy. And that's something that I'm interested in writing about. I'm interested in writing about people thinking that they're changing the world for the better, when in fact they're changing the world catastrophically. And I'm interested in the reverse. I'm interested in people being just low-key brave, <laughs> you know? Changing the world very much on the down low without any ego involved, because just that's how they, that's what, how they do, you know? It's, None, none of it ever seems happy or sad to me, although sometimes people whisper, oh no, while they're hearing me read. I, it all seems like I, I have an urge to give villains POV and have them explain why they think it's a good idea. You know, I have an urge to have heroes explain themselves and get us the sense that maybe the hero has been imbibing too much mythology. I mean, I'm just interested in all of the complexity of the way we tell each other and ourselves stories about what it is to be good. Um, I was just thinking about the fact that uh, when I was growing up uh, in the 70s and 80s, my parents tried to give me um, like lots of black history. You know, I was, uh, my middle name is Keita. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of that generation of young black Americans who, you know, was raised with like, you know, random African national, uh, uh, not national, African cultural names picked out of a book and applied to us with no meaning or anything like that. Um, you know, it, in my case, it was uh, that my uh, father had read uh, the Sundiata Cycle and wanted to name me after a king. I'm like, you couldn't find one queen. Um, but anyway, um, but, but he tried, you know, so I'll take that. Um, but so, you know, my, my parents would give me all this stuff about, you know, surviving slavery and, and people like Harriet Tubman was, you know, my hero when I was growing up and all these people who talked about how much we've been through and how we survived and how that's a great thing, which was useful. But what I was kind of desperate for as a, as a young science fiction reader was where are we in the future? How are, did something happen? Is something going to happen? Because of course I'm reading all these science fiction novels and stories by um, the, the golden age greats, 
Um, and if there's a black person in them, um, you know, they very quickly say, well, it doesn't matter anymore that I'm black. Um, I just mention it for no reason. Um, you know, or whatever. Or, or, um, or they get killed or something happens. And then you realize also that they're the only one. They're the only one in that future. The, 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 the future is, you know, we're going forth, we're meeting aliens, whatever, but the humans are all white dudes. What the hell? And so, um, you know, and, and what I was desperately craving was uh, our future. Where, where are we in the future? Um, and so, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that for me um, ended up being the, the, the way in which I kind of sought that optimism. Um, you know, the future might not be great, but we'll be there. You know, the future might be after the collapse, but we'll still be there. Um, you know, and I need that. Um, so that was that was it for me. I don't yeah, I don't have much to say about this except I'm a like a gloomy Gus as a writer. Um, and um, like it's not like I'm some sort of like edge lord who's like, oh, chaos reigns, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I think I, I first, first of all, like you know, maybe due to like my contamination with like horror fiction at a young age, I like I am just interested in writing about what happens after the bad stuff happens or during the bad stuff happening. Um, but also, I, I you know, I, I just think that life is um, full of um, the things you like and want and the things you don't like and want, and sometimes there's a lot of what you don't want, um, but. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose like the, the hope is just located in dealing with it somehow, living through it somehow. Um, and, and like uh, I think everyone has said in different ways and, and uh, Nora just now, like just being, you know, having a story to tell or having it told about you is, is also, um, it's something, you know, it's not nothing. I remember uh, uh, we took our kids to see um, uh, Into the Spider-Verse, oh, um, which was amazing, yes. Uh, but there was this moment where I saw, um, uh, so our kids are seven and five, and um, they are watching the movie, they loved the movie a great deal, but there was also a moment where, uh, like my son uh, loves Miles Morales, mm. but if I'm honest, he also didn't, he was not as freaked out and happy that Miles Morales existed as I was that Miles Morales existed. Like he, he loves Miles Morales, but he's got, he reads a bunch of, there's a bunch of now like brown and black kids running around in comic books and on animated shows and all this kind of stuff. And so he was just sort of like, that was amazing, all this stuff. And I was kind of doing what your parents did. I was just like, do you understand the paradigm? <laughs> And uh, like sitting him down, let me talk you through the Marvel Universe and show you <laughs> what this is like. Uh, and uh, you know, and, it, and I realized it was such a gift that he could just be like, shut up, dad, whatever. I'm watching this now, I'm watching, and you know, and it didn't yeah. mean, him and my daughter didn't mean anything. Hmm. Now, I shouldn't say didn't mean anything, because he was at least in New York, right? Oh. And uh, has hair similar to my son, so there's a way that that was something. Yeah. But, uh, but just enjoying that way and then at the same time thinking, like uh, my son saw himself in Miles Morales, my daughter hmm. half and half, right? And so sort of being like, okay, so now there's more to do, like there's more work to do, right? Mm -hmm. And there's always more work to do and more people to come in to the tent mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I, so I wanted to uh, ask one last thing before we move into the Q&A portion of things, uh, which was about, um, if there is, let's say, broadly speaking, a sense of, in this moment, or just in life in general, I don't know, uh, if there is dread, if there is fear, if there is rage, all these things, how do you, do you write despite those things? Do you write because of those things? Do you write because you have to pay your bills? I mean, all of those are damn good reasons mm. to write, but I, I just wonder, in the face of, say, what this anthology sort of inspired, how do you get down to, how do you sit down and get to work? I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> I was on book tour when the uh, 2016 election happened with a YA novel. And 
I was in uh, in Florida talking to a bunch of of kids the day after the election. And I thought, how how can I talk to these kids who are all the targets of this? Because they were it was a room full of queer, non-binary people of color, like teenagers who couldn't vote yet. And it was um, I didn't know what I had no it, I get froze. I froze completely. I didn't know what to do. Didn't know how to write for teenagers. Because writing for teenagers is like, it's such a gift to get to do it, to get to set them on fire and send them to do action. How fucking amazing. But I was like, but what if they're all going to be killed by this asshole? And, um, and then they started to talk back to me. They're like, what's going to happen to us? And I was like, I don't know. I don't have an answer. Don't have an answer. And they started, but my books are full of magic. They're full of ferocity. And so we talked about that. We talked about um, how to make stories about being brave. And so now, when I'm sitting at my desk not knowing how to write, because sometimes I'm paralyzed by the everything, um, I think, OK, all you have to do is get to the next sentence and tell, tell a story for one of, not just one of these kids, but like, Tell a story for the you that wouldn't have made it without the stories you read. Tell a story for the, the many people out there who don't get the privilege that I have to tell these stories. And uh, I don't know, beating back the dread is, uh, I'm in the business of looking at it in the light and also in the business of kicking it in the balls. So it's, um, that's, the, that's the work, I think. And you know, what good fortune to get to do that work. I try to keep that in mind because it is good fortune to get to do it. I think the thing about community organizing for me and activism in general, um, having done this work for a long time, is that you have to do it knowing you're probably not going to win. Right? You have to work on fighting to fix things and to change things and to get laws repealed or to get laws put on the books that don't exist or to get assholes thrown out of office or whatever being pretty confident that you're not going to get it, that you're not going to win. It'd be great if you do, um, but the win is not the only reason you do it. You do it because the doing it um, feels good, and the doing it inspires others. Uh, and so, you know, get, getting other folks to see that they can fight back, that they can do something, is the 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 end, not the end goal, but it is the thing that makes it worth doing, even if you don't win in any kind of timely fashion. I just recently we. Um, passed a bill that we spent 10 years fighting for that like uh, we thought was going to be like a easy lift one year campaign. So it's like, yay, we won, but fuck. Um, and so writing fiction is the same thing, especially, you know, I also write young adult um, and being able to write specifically to young folks um, is a privilege and is an honor and is this really exciting way to say to other folks, like, you can see yourself, you can tell a story that's worth telling, um, and we can tell really good stories and those stories have power and meaning. Uh, why I write is just, or what motivates me, um, is just this like disgusting bubbly stew that I have no access to. Like I don't know what the ingredients are; it's just all there. So I can't really say um, how like the current moment has motivated me exactly. Um, although I think like one of the things that um, one of the aspects of, of good writing, or at least good writing as I see it, or as I want to do it, is also just about fighting um, all of the forces that um, are trying to prevent you and the characters you write from just being whole ass complex people. Um, you know, and and these forces can be like very intense and harsh and evil. Um, you know, they can be like Nazis yelling at you on the internet, and they can also just be kind of like publishing and how, you know, publishing wants to like say like, uh, you know, exoticize you and make the most important thing about like the work you publish, you know, um, certain detail, like biographical details, right? Mm -hmm. and, and treat you like, say, at the very best, you know, treat you like medicine, like, oh, you're so important for your background. And, and not as literature, right? Um, 
and at the very worst, you know, just not publish you at all. So um, I, I, I try to think about that, just whole ass complex people and writing, and that is what I focus on, and I think that is part of that mission. Thank you all. This, uh, can we, before we move into Q, and, uh, I guess we shouldn't do a round of applause now, but we should, we should for them. That was amazing. And as, uh, as people are gearing up to raise their hands and dare to ask questions uh, <laughs> of our group of writers here, I wanted to throw out there just because I, I feel like it's, uh, it's a, a thing that should, not be, should, should be said often in public, right? So uh, John, Joseph Adam, ja John Joseph Adams and I are listed on the cover as the editors, but we have a third editor, the editor who actually acquired the book, uh, Victory Matsui, and uh, who came up with the title for the amazing, so John sold the book, and he had whatever title he had, and then Victor was just like, I'm telling you, this is the better title. <laughs> and then it was absolutely the better, it was amazing, and uh, has been amazing throughout this process, and I think you should give them a, a round of applause as well. <laughs> yes. All right, now after all that warming up, I see a question right here. Is it possible to uh, pass the mic? Thanks a lot. First, a little quick anecdote. When I was in high school, geometry class, seventh period, sophomore, Mr. Levine used to teach us or read to us articles from the Times and teach us how to fold the paper when we're on the subway. One day he comes in and he reads the story that the kids today are horrible, they don't listen, they, uh, they think they know it all, on and on and on and on. And so we thought it was contemporary. Then he points out that this was written by Socrates about the youth of Athens. <laughs> and the, the, the theme that day was that human nature doesn't change. And basically my question is, since human nature doesn't change, we are a continuing story. And how do you, what, what part of your thinking process goes into the fact that there really aren't that many new stories, it's just repeated the same story. And lastly, for Alice, do you know how to frown? Oh, Maria. Oh, Maria, I'm sorry. Are you I know how to... because I think, I know how to frown. <laughs> 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 But I you think see you're where I'm going that frown, so, uh... Yeah, lots of us know how to frown. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you've been, you know, smiling all the time. I don't know how. All right, so was I think the question was about question? how do you okay. deal with um, uh, the fact that human nature doesn't change, so how do you tell, how do you feel like you'll be able to tell new stories if, how can you tell new stories if all human stories are the same? if you agree with that premise. I disagree, human nature has changed. We are not living in the era of Socrates anymore, thank God. Um, that alone should be proof that that's not true. Anyone else, how do you? I like to use everything that we've, we've made. Um, the idea that, that human nature doesn't change, I also find suspect, because I think we all change every day in every little possible way. And I think that all of humanity has changed in many different uh, intense ways, which thrills me. Um, but, I, but I love the idea that we can go mining the glory of literary history is that we can mine in the past, go and dig in old stories, go and look at what is the same and what is different. And that's, that is nothing but inspiring. That's, you know, that's not a bummer at all. It doesn't block me. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It's like, it's great. I can steal stories from all kinds of places and make them super queer. Um, yeah, uh, I, I agree with everybody. And also, also like, let I mean, I, I just, I, I guess the idea itself, like I, I take issue, or I, I would take issue with in so many ways just to, it, it's not provable or definable, I think, what human nature is. Um, you, could, you could look into the past and find kind of commonalities uh, with the present, but 
you don't know it's because of human nature being this unchangeable monolith, or you don't know if it's because of um, you know technological change. You don't. You just don't know. So I, I think I don't really keep that idea in my head. Um, that's all. I would also add that one tiny thing of uh, I remember I was doing research for a book, a previous book, and there was a thing that I like a tiny offhand thing that I marveled at. It was a story about a woman who. Um, from, I want to say, the 1600s or 1500s. She uh, has, she marries very young. She has something like eight or nine kids. Um, and at the age of like 27 or something like that, she leaves her family behind and she goes to Jerusalem and she becomes like a religious seeker. And the book is actually just entirely about her life as a religious seeker completely. And there's this cast off thing that the, the, uh, the biographer of this uh, woman says, which is that, um, um, we don't know anything essentially about her childhood from like be before the age of 16 when she married because in that time period no one thought children had inner lives. So they didn't record children and what they did. Right? You just didn't exist essentially till you were 16. And what I took that to, in part to mean was that every, there are so many ways that so many people have not been treated as if they have an inner life. That to, along the lines of like, it still being an unproven fact that human nature is the same, that one of the beauties of literature, to say nothing of history and memoir and all the rest, is that like all of it is building the data set for what human nature actually is. And the shock to me often, and the beautiful shock, is how three people, five people, 10 people encounter the same moment and take it in 10 different ways and it takes them in 10 different directions. And so, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess we're all just sort of disagreeing. <laughs> and that's OK. OK, we have a question here. Yes. Hi, I'm an historian in training in grad school right now. And I was wondering, um, I'm, fascinated, I'm fascinated by received texts. And I was wondering what text of yours would you want to be received hundreds or thousands of years down the line? I'm not familiar with that term. What, what are received texts? Received texts are texts that have been copied down through generations and are not found archaeologically later on. So there can be a difference between, like, there's the received version of the Tao Te Ching versus the archaeological version, where the Da and the Tao are switched. So it's a different order in the text. So it's like, which of your books would you want to be handed down by People versus which ones would? Uh... Either one, but I feel like received texts have more impact on a culture okay. because they keep copying it. They keep it within the culture versus uh, archaeological texts. All right, so which will it be for each of you? Which I one will? That? Yes. Um, my answer is very easy. I think, oh, I think it's a cool and beautiful idea. Uh, I did not uh, know that term. Uh, and I haven't written it. I would like to think I haven't written it, and <laughs> that would be something um, uh, to strive for or, or, or to think about that would be lovely, but I haven't done it yet. Yeah, right now my answer is my novel, Black for City, available in bookstores <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but, but in a year, I'll have a different answer. <laughs> well, I'm translating Beowulf right now. So I am actually doing exactly what you're talking about. I'm grabbing it from, not only from the original version, which is a copy of a copy of a copy, but also from all of the ideas that translators have had about it, translating it into English. So I hope that my translation skews the curve of what that text means. That's the goal. I'm, or maybe writes the curve of what that text means, because I think that my tra in my translation, Grendel's mother isn't a monster, and that's pretty scholarly proven stuff. But not in the translations. You would think she was a really horrible monster in all of the old white dude translations out there for the last 100 years. So I'm hoping that what happens is that people go, oh, she was a warrior, obviously, like, like your kids, you know, where they're not, they're not like she's a she's not a monster, they're like, she's the one with the sword. Um, I, I have a weird visceral 
nope reaction to the idea of any of, any of my works being passed down like that. Um, and I think it's largely because um, I know how texts like that get perverted to suit whatever agenda um, the, the people passing it down have. Um, and I don't want my work used as a weapon at any point. Um, I, you know, or if it, if it is, I want it to be used as a weapon against the man, you know, or whatever. <laughs> I don't even know. But like, I don't want the man passing it down. Um, and that is the sort of thing that I feel like might happen in, in that kind of scenario. So, um, and also my stuff tends to be contextual and, and fairly specific. Um, I don't think I've written anything that timeless or timely. I don't know about timely, but timeless um, that can impart those kinds of messages. So, nothing. <laughs> I think we have time for one more oh question. Gosh. Yes. So, as one of the few dark faces in the room tonight, I can understand why people who have held a stranglehold on power and visibility for generations might have a hard time seeing that human nature has changed. Um, and I have to push back on you, NK, because I think the Broken Earth trilogy, which I read in 10 days, will live forever. Amen. <laughs> and <laughs> as somebody who also dabbles in writing sci-fi, you manage to see pretty much everybody. There are trans people, there are white people. Like I even felt love for Shafa at the end of the damn series. So <laughs> what I wanted to ask you Shafa's specifically. Shafa's got a fandom, I don't know what's I mean, I that. just, I don't know how I feel about it though. I don't know, you know, I don't know how I feel because I like him at the end, it was weird. But what I wanted to ask is, it was meticulous. How did you manage to see and sort of validate so many people? Um, like it, I know it had to have been a conscious goal of yours, but how did you do that? And and can you talk to me more about your commitment to doing that? I write the world I see around me, and that world is not just one type of people. Um, the 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 lament that I have is that I don't always have the skill to capture people whose experiences are widely different from my own. Um, but I'm trying to develop it. So that's all I got. Thank you, though. And thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs> One more round of applause for that. <laughs>